Hello and welcome back to the Student Hub Live. Okay, we've been having some great business discussions and we've just heard from some tutors about B100 and we've been asking you lots and lots of questions um, in our interactive widgets. We've got some more for you here um, now, but before we were asking you about the extent to which being here was sort of helping you understand how curriculum related to your studies um, and whether you felt more prepared to study. And a lot of you did, but some of you were unsure. Well, in this session, we're going to discuss some issues that are related to your studies um, um, and from a business perspective, we take a look at Secrets of Silicon Valley. So I'm joined by um, Peter Bloom and, and Steve Godrich um, and Isadora Corti. Thank you for coming along um, to talk about this subject, which really is about um, communication and technology uh, and, and the impacts that, that a lot of this is having on society. Um, so, Peter, could I ask you to sort of kick her off on, on this in terms of how you see things at the minute? Sure. I think that we're in a really interesting and exciting time. Uh, technology has the opportunity to completely change business and society. And this is on a larger level about how we even do business, how we think about the economy. Uh, for instance, in 30 years, we may not even have to go to work every day, for instance, um, to the kind of everyday organizational level, using data actually to make your job easier and to using robotics or automa automated processes to make a workforce that doesn't have to do such kind of monotonous things and actually can focus on creative and interesting things. Um, so we're seeing the ways in which technology, particularly robotics, artificial intelligence, and kind of the internet of things are rapidly changing, not only business, but the economy and society more generally. I think one of the kind of interesting elements that really I think students uh, across our modules are going to be looking at is kind of seeing the ways in which a lot of assumptions that were quite accepted even 10 years ago are now being challenged. So it's a really interesting time to study um, this because they are in many ways you know, the creators of the future. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who's going to actually be able to say, how are we going to use this technology to make for a more empowered workforce? How are we going to make this technology to make for smarter and more empowering organizations and cities. Sure, but you mentioned the time factor, and, and mm -hmm. one thing that I'm conscious of is that you know this was something that was being said a long time ago. Sure. Oh, you know, I remember when they were saying you know robots will be doing all of these jobs. I remember when people said there won't be magazines or newspapers now that the internet's here because everyone's going to be you know accessing the media in these ways. And yet, lo and behold, we still see magazines and Absolutely. things. So, to what extent do we think these sort of things, these concepts, are mm -hmm. really going to happen? I mean, we've seen some of the drone stuff at the minute, Absolutely. and these brilliant ideas that sort of seem so future-proof, um, in reality, have a lot of implications that we can't always think about before we implement them. Absolutely. I mean, I think that there has been a lot of talk, uh, some of you may hear, hear of it, of this kind of fourth industrial revolution. And this is around the ways in which artificial intelligence in particular, but also robotics, is going to, you know, again, transform our economy. But you're right, it's a much more integrative process and often gradual process than we may like to think. And a key thing that I think we try to get across, across the undergraduate curriculum, um, and is certainly in our research, is the fact that this isn't preordained. This isn't something in which, it, almost like in a kind of Blade Runner type of way, I feel maybe I'm being dated. Uh, it's one of my favorite movies when I was growing up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it would be everyone's. But, you know, that we have this dystopia of mass unemployment, um, and there's nothing we can do about it. In fact, quite the opposite. Right now, we have so many opportunities to actually say, artificial intelligence is going to make a huge difference. Internet of Things is going to make a huge difference. But it's up for us to decide how we want this to look. So I think one example of what you're speaking about um, that we can see in our everyday life is uh, the gig economy. Mm. Right? Now, this has been something that has grown increasingly popular. And a lot of people feel they have like very little control over this. And they feel like their jobs are much more precarious and also feel as if this is something in which they can't change or influence. But I think the recent decision around Uber, where London actually said, we're quite excited about innovation, but you have to respect employment rights. Mm -hmm. You have to respect customer safety. This is an example of the ways in which you know, traditional forms of regulation and new forms of regulation, but also the ways in which we think about what we would like is going to change how we have technology in our society and organizations. 
Mm. So where does this whole idea then, I mean, we, we are seeing uh, the students at home about uh, the distinction between collaboration and competition and openness. Um, and, you know, to some extent that the whole issue with Uber, you know, th there are issues around competition. I mean, you know, I saw some posts on Facebook about, you know, the, the rate of a taxi um, and, and how much it would cost with various sorts of forms of a black cab versus an Uber versus the bus versus, you know, getting someone to pick you up, etc. So there's all sorts of things going on in terms of competition and, and openness and how we view these things as well as the these issues of how we're using technology. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think Isidore can speak more to collaboration uh, in the broader terms, especially how it relates to competition. I think in terms of something like Uber, it's also interesting to think about the fact that we have things like Uber and we can balance, you know, having things that are low cost, being able to use platforms to make things more convenient and things that are safe and that actually protect drivers' rights. I think as well as that, looking more forward thinking, you know, in uh, Milton Keynes, it's one of the first cities in the world that has piloted the use of driverless cars and taxis. So the real question then might not be about the fact of, you know, who, you know, this competition of which type of cab company is going to win, but actually, are we going to have to pay for cabs in the future? And if not, and if we have this different type of system, how do we make sure that we create a society where the people who lose out from this, such as the drivers, whether they're black cabs or Ubers, are actually protected and can also be empowered by it? But I think, Isabel, you can speak perhaps a little more to the kind of collaborative element. Um, yeah, I, I think that actually collaboration becomes increasingly important uh, in today's very demanding and complex and changing business environment where we actually have different organizations that they have to come together and work in order to survive, in order to innovate, to keep growing and essentially actually uh, achieve some time of long term existence. And this is particularly the case, I think, in the technology industry, uh, because it is actually a basic ingredient in order to make innovation happen. Uh, we need to bring different organizations together, mm -hmm. and even if they compete uh, in one area or in one market, mm -hmm. they actually come together and they become stronger against their competitors, mm -hmm. while at the same time, they may become weaker uh, against each other, but still uh, they bring a stronger face uh, in the competitors. And I think that we may actually say that competition is actually... Maybe uh, collaboration is a competition in a different form, in one mm -hmm. sense, because we have competitors coming together, and collaboration becomes uh, a very important skill for the organization to survive. Um, today, uh, which is very difficult to penetrate new markets or actually to have uh, the development of new products, uh, that can be done in a very fast and efficient way uh, with collaborations. So we see, for example, that uh, Facebook recently, I think, they have established a partnership between different universities in order to have some research and make sure that they have, uh, they explore new revenue streams uh, in order to, for artificial intelligence and I think virtual reality as well. Mm. Um, and if I quote, uh, I think it was the CEO of LinkedIn, of LinkedIn which actually uh, he said that uh, if we want to create big, pro big uh, products, we cannot do it alone. We always need someone else. So I think what is interesting, and I think that what the module will actually reflect as well, is that uh, the collaboration is a basic element in today's environment, especially in the technology industry, but in other industries as well. But what it is unique in Silicon Valley, I think, is actually that they have this uh, business environment which attracts uh, many businesses and startups uh, because they have this uh, collaboration and this uh, openness as the basic attitude. Mm -hmm. And there are many examples that they actually illustrate that. So can you just tell us, we've asked people um, at home about collaboration and competition and about openness. Um, and we're going to see what students at home say. And do keep filling that word cloud in. But what do you mean by openness and, and collaboration? I'm getting the sense that what you're saying is that, you know, collaboration isn't quite as dichotomous as, as competition. You know, within collaboration, there is an element of competition as well. So it's not quite as um, clean as one might initially think. Um, and we can explore that later. I mean, actually, just uh, I'll tell you what students at home have said about their collaboration versus competition. 77% um, disagree with the statement that competition is more important than collaboration. So that's good. But it'll be interesting to see what you guys think openness means. So fill those examples out on the word cloud. Um, and if you can only think of one or two, just press a zero um, or a dot to send the, the results in. So tell us, what do we mean by openness? I think it is part of collaboration as well. So it's like uh, being willing to work with others and share information and knowledge in order to uh, create something bigger, something uh, uh, more useful, or to offer the best services uh, to the public and the customers. 
Uh, maybe it's about uh, being uh, actually receptive and interesting to new ideas, uh, accept these ideas and offer to people the opportunity to express and test these ideas. And of course, to continue to be willing to constantly change, adapt and innovate so as to respond to these changing needs of the market and the customers. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe as a conclusion, maybe it is a mindset uh, mm -hmm. of devotion to innovation, uh, stability, collaboration mm -hmm. and openness uh, and being willing to test and explore new ideas, think differently mm -hmm. in one way. I think also to add to that, because I think that was you know, a perfect kind of description of the importance of openness is also to think about the ways in which, in a concrete level, openness is now, and, and I think you put it perfect, Isidore, like becoming a competitive advantage, right? So if you look at something like 3D printing, it was actually, you had this kind of traditional 20th century patent-based uh, mentality about it. And then all of a sudden, they, and they weren't getting very far with it. And then all of a sudden they said, why don't we actually turn this into an open source problem? Mm -hmm. So we're going to put all the information we have about 3D printing on the web, and anyone who has an idea about it can talk about it and can do this type of problem solving. And within two years, 3D printers, almost all the major flaws were fixed. And actually, they were able to market at a relatively uh, expensive, accessible price. And I think what Silicon Valley has shown, though in a quite marketized way, but I think they're going to have to face this, is that a lot of things that are very market-driven and very closed, they're going to have to shift because they're going to have to compete with these kind of open communities that are open to new ideas, but also open to access about saying, knowledge is something that we can all share and we can all contribute to problem solving and contribute our own experience, whether it be around products, whether it be around technology, or whether it's huge problems like urban transportation, right? Well, let's see what students said. Um, we closed this widget a little while ago, so things may have changed, but um, we asked what openness means. And there are a lot of very, very positive words coming through the word cloud um, that you've supplied us with. So things like honesty sharing, broad-minded, taking a broad view, access to learning, taking on ideas, um, diversity of views, transparency, lack of restriction, um, good ethics. So very, very positive, open, collaborative ideas. So. Is this always a good thing then? I mean, you mentioned the sort of idea that sometimes people will eventually have to compete with each other. So being open can, you know, really drive good business practice and, and ideas. But but is it always good? Well, there's there's obviously two points of view. You could have a very pessimistic view and say, well, you know, it's bad. And, you know, that historically we're used to organisations competing with each other in a very traditional way. Or you could take the more optimistic view and say, well, actually, this is beneficial, as Peter said, you know, for us all to share knowledge for the benefit of all humanity and, and the world in general. Um, and I think what you've heard from Peter and Isadora reflects how business is changing um, in terms of it becoming more globalised, in terms of more integrated and so on and so forth. Uh, and these are some of the challenges that you know we're all having to come to terms with. And the nature of work itself is changing. So uh, it's, it's a very different world that we're operating in now. Mm. No, absolutely. I wonder if we could link some of this back to curriculum, because this is one of the things that we're trying to talk about is how these big ideas are actually seen within modules. And, you know, we can see sort of some of the, the traits that are coming through here. But Steve, I wonder if you could talk us through B207, um, shaping business opportunities and how some of these examples um, are taught. Well, uh, a lot of students come in through doing B100, the introduction to business studies and so on. And that gives a good grounding on various aspects of business. And then moving on to level two, second year, which students will get onto very quickly, they start being faced with something really quite interesting. And the whole issue of um, globalization, innovation, sustainability, organizations being sustainable is addressed in a, in a very sort of forward looking kind of way, looking at how the future might be and how we as participants in that and studying it can affect and change things. Um, I brought my uh, tennis ball along because it's one of the examples we use in B207 is uh, it's, it, we track how many miles the constituent parts of a tennis ball uh, travel wow. to be made into one of these things that then gets whacked at Wimbledon on a on a opening Monday morning. And how far is it? Um, it's just it's over 50,000 miles and perhaps the, the oddest thing is that the the wool that you see here gets shipped from New Zealand back over to the UK to be treated then get shipped back to the Philippines to then be whacked onto one of these things. So th the purpose of, of the uh, example really is to show how integrated the world is now. You know, uh, Wimbledon 20 years ago used to get these from a factory in Barnsley. So things are coming a lot more international. Um, Kristen and Michelle. 
got students from a lot of different nations. We've got Germany, Cyprus, Italy. Kristen, obviously, well, not obviously, but Kristen's from the US originally. I'm from New Zealand <laughs> As originally. As you can tell from my accent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we, we've had some interesting comments from students. Bruce has said that collaboration is fascinating as it is such a disruptive concept for capitalism. And Ashley has said AI, robotics, and gig economy are all hot topics in the company that she works for, and she's instantly impressed that the Open University is too. Excellent. Anything to feedback on any of those comments? Well, it's just great that the students are, are kind of uh, um, on board with it all and, and kind of excited by it, um, as we all are. You know, we're kind of into the, the idea that the OU and and our particular faculty is, is very much thrusting forward in these areas and, and we're looking forward rather than back. So, yeah, it's all good stuff. So, students, we've been talking today about um, studying, uh, starting to study and um, just sort of, I guess, in terms of uh, being open and being collaborative and sharing. I wonder if you guys could give us your final thoughts on what you'd recommend for new students. We've been talking about plagiarism and some of the business ethics and that, um, but we've seen that, you know, obviously working together seems to be a better idea than working alone. And we've been talking about engaging with tutors and forums and the Open University and the student support teams, etc. So what would your advice be um, for new students who are just starting and particular business, because we know there are a lot of level one business students out yeah. here today. What would you say to them um, in, in the spirit of being open and collaborative? Absolutely, just dive straight in there. Uh, everybody will have, all the tutors that students have will have a tutor group forum. I would get stuck in there and the tutor will have posted some topics to get people started, have a conversation with fellow students. Um, There'll be some great ideas, there'll be some great questions there. In fact, you'll probably want to post a question yourself as a student thinking, well, I don't know about this, that and t'other. And fellow students are, are a great help and assistance and support, as is the tutor. So it's really just get involved as much as anything. What would you say, Isadora? You know, I myself am a new member at the OU and what I have really admired is actually that there are so many different platforms and systems in place and processes in order to increase collaboration between uh, the uh, tutors or between tutors and uh, students as well that I couldn't have imagined before uh, joining the OU. So I think that the students, first of all, they, they, they must find ways to become aware of this, but they are everywhere in the website and the curriculum anyway. We do advertise these ways, but they should try to take advantage and actually use them because they they, they are very good platforms to increase collaboration between students, as well as to take advantage of the staff and the knowledge that the staff uh, has as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Good point. Thank you. Peter? I think, uh, and this might sound kind of funny, but to enjoy it. I think when you when you start, and I know when I, I started uh, my first year of course, there was a lot of nervousness, and I have to learn everything right away, and feeling quite overwhelmed. Um, and then if I look back, I think, and, you know, Take a breath and remember, this is, you know, for as much as you have all this new information, it's meant to be engaging, it's meant to be fun, and it's meant to be stimulating. So within all the kind of new experiences and the activities and the ability to collaborate, to also just enjoy it. Because um, I think that's, if you enjoy what you're doing and you're really looking forward to it, even if you don't catch everything right away, you are motivated and you kind of remember you're in this because you you want to, you know, be excited about things. You want to learn new things. So, I think the enjoyment part, you know, would be my advice. Yeah. No, absolutely, an important thing, and I think something that's very easy to forget amongst trying to get organised and <laughs> sorted with everything. But you're right. You know, if you're open to the ideas um, and and learning and open to mistakes as well, mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's a really important part of the whole process. Lovely. Well, Isadora and Peter and Steve, thank you very much um, for that interesting discussion. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it at home as well. Um, we've got another very short session um, for you next uh, where I'm going to talk to Mike Lucas um, about apprenticeships. So don't go away. We've got a short video before then um, with Steve and Annalise to show you another side behind the scenes. So we'll see you in a couple of minutes for that next session.